Hello and welcome to my video on how to sew your own jeans. I've tried to make this video as beginner friendly as possible, so if you're already somewhat familiar, I'd like to apologize in advance if I'm going over stuff that you already know. I would highly recommend watching this video all the way through before actually starting the project so that way you know what to expect and if you even want to do this. There's a free pattern available in the description. There's three different files, letter size and A4 or if you want to print it at home. Letter is a North American size and A4 is for the rest of the world. Just make sure that you're downloading the right one and when you print, it's not set to fit printable area but instead actual size or 100%. There's a three inch guide on two of the pages which you can use to check your scale on. You can print just those pages first to check. Once you have it all printed out, you'll have to cut the borders off of the pages, which is marked by the rectangle around the edge of the page. You'll need to line up all the squares and circles on the edges of the pages and then tape them together. Here's a map of what it will look like once it's assembled. The third file is an ARC E size which you can get printed at any print shop. This will cost a little bit, but you won't have to trim the borders or use any tape. Just print it out and cut out the pieces like a normal store-bought pattern. This is roughly a men's size 34, but I'll be showing you how to make it fit your size exactly. I'm including this so you'll have something to be able to follow along with. If you want to do something else or you need another size, I have a video on how to take apart clothes for their pattern which you can use to make whatever else you would want. If you're new to sewing, I would recommend that you read through the instruction manual for your machine first. If you don't have yours, you can usually find them online for free by just looking up your machine's name, and as well, to watch this video on thread tension, but I'll remind you about both of these at the end of the video. This is everything that I'm using for materials and tools, but depending on how you work, you may not need everything on here, or you may need other things on top of this. You'll figure out during the video what everything is used for and what you need to have. For your machine, you need to have something that has both adjustable stitch width and stitch length. If you have a more modern machine, you'll definitely have these. For fabric, you'll need two different types. For the exterior, you can pick anything really. I prefer cotton twill, but anything that feels pant-like is good. And as well, you'll need something lighter weight for the lining of the front pockets. Something I used to do when I first started sewing was to buy curtains from secondhand stores. It's very inexpensive and it's not much of a worry if you make a mistake with it. Whenever you're making something that you plan on washing as a finished garment, you should have washed the fabric before you'd even sewn it. This way, if the fabric's going to shrink, misalign, or in some cases even fall apart, you'll figure out before you've done any work. For the sake of this video, I've printed my fabric with this alligator pattern. This will hopefully make it easier for you watching so that you can tell the right and wrong sides apart from each other. The first thing to do is to cut all of the pattern pieces. If you need to flatten any of your pieces, you can iron them with no steam. The notches for the back yoke should be cut from the pattern. This will help with alignment later. For the placement for the coin pocket and back pocket, you can cut the shape out of the pattern piece. Every piece has a grain line. This shows what direction it should be cut in. You want to align each grain line arrow with the selvage of your fabric. For most fabrics, you're able to spin any piece 180 degrees. For the notches that we cut out of the pattern, you can mark the fabric with a pen or chalk. Make sure that you use your lighter weight fabric for cutting out your pocket lining. For any piece that mentions reverse, it means you need to flip over the pattern to get a reverse cut of the same piece. So the legs, for example, need a left leg and a right leg. To get this, you have to cut the pattern piece once with the text facing up, and then once again with the text facing down. Otherwise, you can flip the fabric over onto itself instead of the pattern and cut both pieces at the same time, but if that's too much to line up, it's probably best to just cut one piece at a time. As well, keep in mind that some fabrics don't have a front and back side. This is usually more common with lighter fabrics. Even if your fabric looks the same on the front and back, you'll have to pick a right and wrong side to be able to follow along. For the pocket lining, I'm basing in some pink thread. I'm doing this so you can tell the sides apart from each other. The longer dashes are for the wrong side and the dots are for the right side. You do not have to do this. We're going to start by assembling the front pockets. The first thing to do is the top edge of the coin pocket. We'll fold it over by a half inch and then fold it over a second time by a half inch again so that no raw edge is visible. Then we'll press the seam in place using an iron. For this project, any normal polyester thread can work. You can use sew all thread for the entire pants if you want. If you have something stronger like upholstery thread or anything that's intended for top stitching, you could use that as well. Just make sure that your machine is threaded and tensioned correctly for what you're sewing. As well, you want to set your stitch length to something medium or medium high. Every machine is different, but you want about an eighth of an inch for most of the seams on this. And as well, every time that you start or stop a stitch, you need to sign on or off. To do this, just go back and forth before you start and after you end a stitch. If you don't do this, the seam will be able to come undone. If you do it correctly, everything should stay in place. And lastly, it's very important that you put your presser foot down before sewing. For one, your machine won't properly form stitches with your foot up. But more importantly, when your foot is up, you could sew your finger, which would hurt a lot. It's one of the more common, if not only, injuries for someone who's new to sewing, and it's completely avoidable if you just remember to set your presser foot down. Please remember to do it. Now we can sew along the top edge of the coin pocket, and then flip it over and sew along the other edge of the fold. I'm sewing two coin pockets to have one on each side, but you can do two, just one, or skip them completely. And that's what it should look like once you're done. After that, we're going to fold over the other three sides of the coin pocket. Each of these folds will be half inch as well. Next, we'll put the pattern for the pocket facing on top and line up the coin pocket so we can pin it in place. 
Then remove the pattern and we can top stitch it onto the facing. Start at the top edge of one side and go all the way around the edges. Then come in 3 eighths of an inch from the sides and stitch at that same distance all around the edges until you finish the stitch in the same place that you started. It should look like this when you're finished. When sewing areas that are more layers than usual, it's best to hand turn your stitches, such as the top of the coin pocket where it's thicker than the rest of the edges. If your feed dogs don't correctly pull the fabric because of how thick something is, it can break your needle. Normally breaking needles is just part of sewing, but in cases like this it's often avoidable. By using the hand wheel on your machine, you'll be able to sew as slowly as you want and be able to align everything as it should be. Notice the way your hand wheel turns when you're sewing normally and turn it in that same direction and look at the needle to ensure that it is always going straight down and never bent against the fabric. This does depend a bit on your machine, but you can only spin your hand wheel the correct way. You can often spin it in reverse, but only when your needle is above the throat plate. Rotating your hand wheel in reverse when the needle is submerged will nest your thread, if not worse. Next, we'll fold two of the edges on the pocket facing. These are the two that aren't on the edge of the pocket lining. We'll fold them over by a half inch and press them in place. You can trim this bit that sticks out after you fold it. Now I'm placing it down with its right side up. Then we can place the pocket facing in the corner of the pocket lining and pin it in place. Then we can sew around the edge of all sides and when you're done it should look like this. When you fold the pocket lining in half, you'll notice this little bit pokes out here at the top. This is intentional and many patterns will have this. It's to make it easier to get things in and out of your pockets, so don't trim this. Next we can place one of our pant legs on the table with its right side up and place the pocket facing on top with its right side down. Just match it up how it looks in this video and then pin it all in place. When sewing seams like this, we're going to be using a half inch seam allowance, meaning that where we're going to be sewing will be a half inch off of the edge of the fabric. You can measure a half inch off of the needle and place a piece of tape there to use as a guide, or you can buy one of these magnetic guides. Now we'll sew the seam that we pinned in the previous step. I like to trim about an eighth of an inch off because I'm working with a medium weight fabric, but you don't have to do this step if you don't want. Next we'll cut some triangles out of the curved area of the seam allowance. You want to leave a tiny gap between the tip of the triangle and the stitch. You don't want to cut the stitch here. By taking out these little bits of fabric, you'll make it much easier to turn out in the next step, and this is what it should look like when you're done. Next, we'll iron this seam open, meaning that we'll push each side of the seam allowance away from each other. This will make it easier to fold up the seam the way we want to in the next step. I'm ironing on a tailor's ham. This is really helpful for ironing curves, but you can do it flat as well. Next, we'll flip the pocket lining to the way that it wants to sit, and we can press it in place. You don't have to do this like I am, but it's nicest if you push the edge where the two fabrics meet back by about an eighth of an inch or so. This will ensure that the pocket lining won't be visible when you're wearing the pants. Next, we're stitching just off the edge to keep that fold in place, then I'm sewing a second time about three eighths of an inch off the edge. A great trick for sewing straight lines on edges is to put one of your fingernails up against both the edge of the fabric and the edge of the presser foot. This will keep the two of them in line with each other. The next step is to place the pocket lining wrong sides together and pin it in place. Instead of a half inch, we'll be sewing this at a quarter inch for the next seam. Just sew the very bottom edge and follow its curve. This one seam may be tricky if you're using very heavy weight thread, so you may need to change it over to a sew all. Now we'll even this out. You don't really need to trim anything here, but just make sure that the seam allowance is as even as possible. This will help us with the next step. Now we'll take the pocket and turn it so it's right sides facing together or wrong sides facing out. We'll iron the bottom so it lays flat, and that's what you should have so far. If you look inside, you should be able to see this unfinished edge. That's the seam allowance from the previous step. Next, we'll top stitch the bottom of the pocket at about a quarter inch off the edge. Make sure to sign on and off of these stitches here. A trick if you're using lighter fabric, instead of putting your machine in reverse, is to drop the needle at the very end, pick up your presser foot, spin your work 180, put your presser foot back down, and start sewing again. This will ensure that you can stack the stitches nicely that you're signing off with and prevent it from bunching up. Now we can fold the pocket bag how it wants to sit and iron it in place. This top area here should get pinned in place. And on this side, you can see how the front of the pants sticks out past the pocket facing. Here we'll just place the front pant piece on top and line everything up. Now sew just off the edges to keep everything in place. This is what it should look like when you're done. These stitches won't be visible on the finished pants and are only here to keep everything in place until we've sewn the rest of the pants together. Now we'll move on to the fly. Piece number 7, which is the openings, will be folded in half wrong sides facing together and the other one, piece number 6, which is the buttons, will be folded in half right sides facing together. You can press these to keep them folded and you should be left with two pieces like this. We'll sew a 45 degree angle off of one of the corners of piece number 6. The side that we need to sew should be clear once you see the next step. We'll cut it an eighth of an inch off the edge and then turn it out to create this shape, and you can iron it flat. Now we'll move on to piece number 7. I'm finishing the edge on my serger, and it should look like this once you're finished. If you don't own a serger, you can just set your stitch width up and sew the edge so that the needle lands in the fabric every other stitch, and the other half of the stitches will wrap up the edge so it doesn't fray. As well, if you read through your machine's manual, you may find out that your machine is able to do its own version of overlock. Now we can mark the openings. Just place your buttons on top and see how many you want to use. I'm going to use three, but just remember that the top half inch of this piece is seam allowance for the waistband. Next, mark exactly where you want your openings to go. An easy trick if you ever want to find the midpoint of something is to use a measuring tape or even a piece of string and fold it in half. I have a computerized machine that I use to do this, but you can do it manually as well. 
just set your stitch width to the middle and your stitch length way down and sew a line, followed by a second one adjacent to it. Then set your stitch width up a little bit more and close up the distance between the two of them. To make the actual openings, we'll put a straight pin across the middle and push your seam ripper towards the middle. The pin will stop you from accidentally going too far. Then repeat it from the opposite direction. Remove the pin and break the last bit by putting your seam ripper underneath and pushing up. Now we'll place down the right pant leg with piece number 6 on top of it. We're going to mark 1 inch above the bottom point of piece number 6 on the pant leg. Now we'll make a half inch cut where the mark was drawn. Then we can pin it in place, set our seam guide to half inch and sew. We're going to sew right up to where we made the cut in the previous step. You can serge the allowance here if you want. Then we'll press it in place so that it looks like this and top stitch right on the edge. And that's what you should have now. Next we're moving on to the left pant leg. Place it down and we'll place piece number 7 on top and measure 1 inch up from the bottom. I'll use chalk so it's easier to see. I'm using a pin to keep this area down. All of this area here will get folded over by half inch and then pressed in place. Then we'll fold all of this edge here above the mark into itself to hide the edge within the fold. All of this area above the mark is folded twice and at the mark the double fold will transition into a single fold. Once you're done you can stitch it in place and you want to stop where the mark is and make sure to sign off. Now I'm placing it down wrong side up. This is what you should be left with and you can press this area right here after where the stitch ended to a half inch fold. Then we can place piece number 7 right on top. We want to set this piece back by about an eighth of an inch off of the edge. This is so it won't be visible when wearing it. Once you have it all in place you can pin it and sew starting at the top edge down to the center front and then returning back to the top. It should look like this when it's done. Now we'll lay both pant legs down with their right sides facing together. We'll line up this curved area here below the fly, pin it in place and sew. If you're unable to get much of a seam here because of the weight of your fabric or something that's fine because this area will be top stitched in the next step. And I'm also surging what I'm able to along here but you don't really need to finish this edge. Then iron this area from the top and we can move on to the stitching. I'm going to re-explain the fly after I sew this so you can see the stitches. But what I'm doing here is following the edge up past the two rows of top stitching then pivoting, going around a half inch out and then coming back down to about 3 eighths of an inch off the edge. At this part of the stitch we're going to sew a bar tack. We made this part here wider so we'd be able to put in a longer bar tack to avoid having any weak point where the fly opens from. To sew a bar tack set your stitch length way down and your stitch width to around a medium setting or less. You can try it out on a scrap piece of fabric first. Now I'm going to go over this again quickly. I'll try to make this easy to see what's going on. The right sides are black and the wrong sides are either stitched green or chalked green. First fold piece number 7 and half wrong sides together and piece number 6 and half right sides together. Then sew piece number 6 with a 45 degree angle at the bottom and trim the fabric back to about 1 8 of an inch. Piece 7 will get its curved edge finished. Mark 1 inch up off of piece 6 and make a half inch cut at that mark. Then sew it in place, iron and top stitch. Then make the openings for the buttons on piece 7. Place it down on the pant leg, mark 1 inch up from the bottom and fold the edge by a half inch. Then fold the entire area above the mark into itself. Then stitch this in place and put piece 7 on top of the wrong side of the pant leg and stitch along its edge twice. Then place the pant legs together and sew the area below the fly. Iron that area and then start a stitch at the bottom following along the edge. Then pivot 90 degrees and go out about a half inch or so. Then bring the stitch back down to the regular top stitching distance. Lastly, sew a bar tack on top of the highest point of the previous stitch. This doesn't look good because I did it quick, but I hope that clears up any confusion about the assembly of the fly. And this is what the actual fly looks like. Now we'll move on to the back of the pants. Starting with the back pockets, place them right sides facing down and fold over the top edge by a half inch and press it down. Then fold that same edge over by a half inch again and press it down. Then we can stitch at the very top and very bottom of the fold. It's the same thing as when we sewed the coin pocket. You can trim any points that stick out at either side of the top. Then we'll fold the four other sides of the pocket over by a half inch and press them in place. There's going to be these points sticking out at the top again, but this time don't trim them, just iron them. Then lay out one of the back pant pieces with its right sides facing up and put the pattern piece on top. Place the back pocket in the area that's cut out and pin it in place. For this part that sticks out at the top of the pocket, it's best to just push it in. Then sew around the very edge of the pocket and then 3 eighths of an inch off the edge all in one stitch. Remember to use that trick with turning the hand wheel if you get to anywhere that's too thick or a sharp corner. This is what you should have so far, and the next step is the bar tacks. You can skip this if you want, but I like to do it. Just add two at the top of each pocket. Next, we're sewing the back yoke onto the back pant leg. If you sew this on the wrong way, you'll have to take the seam back apart. Place the yoke on top of the back pant leg with the right sides facing together. Make sure the notches are aligned so the taller part of the yoke is at the center back. When placed together like this, the corners here will not be aligned. This is normal, and the edges should only be aligned if the distance of the seam allowance was removed. Once it's pinned, we can sew it. Then serge it which will look something like this. Then we'll press the seam allowance downwards onto the pant leg and not up onto the yoke. Then we can top stitch it twice. Remember to use the fingernail edge guide trick. Then we'll place the pant legs down right sides facing together and pin the entire center back seam. Then we can sew this and serge it. To avoid bulk at the crotch seam, we're going to make the allowances from the front and back be pushed away from each other. This clip is taken from later in the video, but look at how the top stitching is on opposite sides of the edge compared to where the first seam was sewn. 
Press your seam allowance down, then top stitch it twice. You can use folded scrap fabric to level out your presser foot to avoid skipped stitches. And that's the center back seam finished. Now we'll lay out the front and back with the right sides facing together. We'll align the crotch so that the first stitches match up with each other and the areas with the top stitching are diagonal from each other. Pin the center here and we're going to sew this in two stitches instead of just one. This is to ensure that it's absolutely even. Once you have the crotch pinned, you can pin the ankle next. Then pull the distance in between tight and pin it in the middle. Keep breaking up the space like this and once you feel like you have enough pins to sew, you can sew it. When we sew, we'll sign on about an inch before the crotch, so that way, once we have both sides sewn, there'll be a roughly 2 inch overlap of both stitches of the crotch. Next, pin and sew the other side. It's the same thing as last time. Then, we'll finish the edge. For this, we'll do the entire thing in one stitch instead of two. This is what you should have from the right side. Now we're going to push the seam allowance up onto the front of the pants and iron it there. Then, top stitch it twice. We can test fit the pants now. Close up the out seams with safety pins. Do not use straight pins for this. Once you have your safety pins in, you can turn your pants right side out and try them on. Measure how much extra space you have at the waist. I could take out about 2 inches total or half inch off of all 4 edges, so I'm surging those 4 edges and removing a half inch at the same time. Even if you don't need to take out anything here, you still have to finish the edges now. This method of just trimming down the hips does work, but it's not the real way to downsize jeans. Just something convenient for this tutorial. Now we can pin the out seam using the same trick with the pinning of the top and bottom and then pinning the midpoint. Then we can sew that shut. I'm using a tailor's ham for this next step, but you can do it flat otherwise. We'll press this seam open starting from the ankle. Up towards the hip where the pocket facing is, we'll fold the front half of the allowance onto the back half and iron that in place. Next we're going to top stitch that area where the two allowances are folded on top of each other at the hip. This next step can be much easier with the pants inside out. Stitch just off the edge and really make sure that you sign off well at the end. Now we're going to start on the waistband. We'll cut a rectangle that's 4 inches tall by about 40 inches long. I'm positioning mine so I can fit in half of the print, but you can cut yours parallel or perpendicular to the selvage. Now we'll place the right side of the waistband onto the interior of the pants starting at the interior side of piece 7. We'll want to have it extending out by a half inch and we'll pin it where we're going to start our stitch. Then we can sew the waistband. We'll sew at the same half inch seam allowance and we don't need to use any other pins aside from the first one. Just line it up by hand however it wants to fit. Next we'll trim back the excess from where we ended the stitch. We need to leave at least a half inch extra on this side of the waistband. You can leave a whole inch just to be safe. Next we'll press over the waistband so it's going up and above the top of the pants. Then we'll fold over the long side of the waistband by a half inch, and then place that new folded edge just above the back side of our previous stitch. Next we're going to baste on the waistband by hand. We need to do this to avoid roping. It will leave you with a much nicer finished product as opposed to pinning. We'll fold the half inch that sticks out back onto itself and then fold the waistband in half again. We'll press this area to keep it in place temporarily. From here, we'll start sewing at the open end. Remember to tie a knot at the end of your thread so that you can't pull out your previous stitches. We want to keep the lower folded edge on the front of the waistband just above this stitch. You should be able to keep an even distance between the two of them, and you can adjust while sewing to correct it. When we reach the opposite end, we'll fold in the waistband's extra fabric the same way that we did on the other side. Now we're going to top stitch the entire waistband in one stitch. Sign on just above piece number 7 and stitch just off the edge of the waistband until we reach the other side. Then we can pivot and stitch up. I'm using a piece of scrap fabric to keep my foot level. Then we'll pivot again and stitch the very top of the waistband all the way around. Once the top is done, we're going to pivot and go down. It's hard to properly sign off at such an uneven area, so we're going to end our stitch here where the top button will go instead. Stitch down off of the waistband and onto the fly by about an inch. Then pivot again and come up to where the top button will go and sign off right here. Now we can pull out the basting thread from earlier and iron out the waistband again. Next we're sewing the opening for the top button. This is the same as the previous openings. Then we can mark where all the buttons will go. If your machine has a stitch for attaching buttons, use that. Otherwise, you can do it by hand. And that's what the fly should look like once it's finished. For the belt loops, we'll cut a rectangle that's 1 inch wide and around 22 inches long. There's a few different ways you can sew belt loops. The easy way is to use a belt loop folder and a cover stitch machine, but you can do it without those. Just fold the strip of fabric so that the two edges meet in the middle and then iron it in place. Then for stitching, you can either stitch it with a zigzag to keep it closed, or otherwise stitch it twice by going down each side. Both of these work. Then once you have your strip of belt loop stitched, you can cut them to size, which would be about 3 and a quarter inches. Then you can fold over the cut ends by about 3 eighths of an inch and iron them. You can place them wherever you want them to be, and then bar tack them in place. I like to have 6 belt loops. Jeans usually have 5 or 6, but you can do whatever you want. Now we can move on to the hem. It can help you if you turn your jeans inside out for this. Just fold all the way around by a half inch and press it as you go. Then you can fold it over a second time so there's no unfinished edge and press it again. Once you have the entire hem folded twice, you can flip the jeans right side out and stitch. We want to stitch just off the folded edge that you can see from the inside of the jeans. And that's everything. These are the completed pants. It's important to remember that it might take you more than one try to get a pair that you're happy with. This is completely normal and it's just part of sewing, so don't be discouraged if something doesn't work out. Just take note of what went wrong and you can improve for next time. 
For me, I'm able to cut and start sewing one day and finish sewing the next, but if you're new, it'll most likely take you longer than that, and you can't really rush something like this on your first time, so just be prepared, this could take you 20 or more hours. As you do this over and over, that time will come down a lot. I'd like to again remind you to read your machine's instruction manual before you start sewing, and as well to watch the video on thread tension by Alexander Dyer. His explanation is the best I've found online, and understanding this will help you out a lot, so I'll leave his video linked below. And that's pretty much everything for this video. If you want to see more of my work, you can follow me on Instagram. Thanks for watching. Bye.